Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the afternoon session. Um, we have with us here today, Junaid Hashmi. Uh, Junaid has been trying to solve universal literacy as a designer at Google. He leads the design and research for Bolo, a mobile app that helps children learn to read. He has a decade-long experience of leading design teams to solve problems that people have. His work covers problems like how people chat or how students map their career. So Junaid is a designer by profession. He's a chemist by education from IIT Kanpur. His personal interests include games, history, linguistics, and psychology. Junaid also has an interest in education, has taught children with NGOs, and could have been a professor in a parallel dimension. Over to you, Junaid. Thank you so much, Ria. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back in the afternoon after a nice lunch. I hope you guys all would be feeling drowsy and you would just very soon go back to your siesta and I would be able to finish this whole thing up. Uh, but thank you so much, Rhea, for introducing and thank you especially to Dr. Uh, Rath uh, for inviting me over here. Uh, in, in this is an incredible opportunity for me as well to come back to an IIT because I'm myself coming from IIT Kanpur as well and giving a talk here. But this, apart from being an incredible opportunity, this is also a very terrifying opportunity for me because you all are sitting here and it just feels or reminds me of my final year presentation. So if anything goes wrong, please excuse me for everything. I'm just telling you beforehand. Don't keep your expectations quite high. Just consider this as something that I'm doing. And I'm trying to think of a lame excuse to skip this, by the way, right now. But please, bear with me. OK. Uh, I also want to just as uh, something that we usually do whenever we talk outside is I might be representing Google today, but uh, whatever views that we will go through in this presentation in this talk would be my own. Please do not try to associate that with Google's views because those would be uh, thoroughly wetted and a lot more things will go on in that. So these are all my personal views and some of the things that I have learned over the past 10 years in my career. The next thing is, uh, what I wanted to talk about today is quite different from what this whole digital humanities uh, a course might be covering. The thing that I wanted to talk more about today was from the perspective of how industry or the tech industry or people who make products for people uh, approach these kind of problems. And when they come across approaching the problems for creating uh, products for people, what kind of things do we use, what kind of frameworks do we follow, and what kind of tips can I give you if you are also interested in creating some opportunities for the people around? What could you take away from this and uh, start building out stuff? So this would be totally from a practical perspective, not from a theoretical perspective, and all the digital humanity stuff, that is very heavy for me. I would still be able to sit over there and get the lesson. Right now, if you have anything in digital humanities, please don't ask me because I have absolutely no idea on that part. Okay, uh, the way, uh, I'm sorry, I have to get used to this. So please bear with me. I'm sorry, I'll have to probably go here. Yeah, okay. Okay, so the way I'm trying to structure this presentation is for the next one hour, almost one hour, I'll bore you and I'll try to cover as many things as possible in terms of uh, the structure of this presentation, uh, the way we are approaching building products in terms of population, how do we approach and solve this problem? So the way we solve this problem is trying to find out who we are trying to solve this problem for. First of all, the first and most important thing is who is the person that we are solving this problem for? If we are trying to solve this problem for a child, for an adult, for someone else, for a person who is coming from a different background, all those kind of things would come into this consideration. The second thing is how do we approach solving the problems and why do we need to even approach by solving the problem? Uh, why do we need to even build empathy in this case just to be able to understand that the solutions would work for them or not? And the last and the most important thing which I think where you all of you, because you all come from the academic background, would come in strongly is how can we bring in the aspirational part of a person's needs and problems to actually make them empowered by using some tools. Maybe the tool is a technology, maybe the tool is just a wheelchair, maybe the tool is something like a walking cane. So all those kind of things will come strongly from you and this is where my pitch would be. So 
this, this tale uh, would primarily um, cover about 50 to 55 minutes. And after that, I would like to also spend about 15, 20 minutes uh, answering your questions. And unlike my uh, final year presentation, I would be happy to answer questions today. So please feel free uh, to ask any type of questions in this regarding uh, the research that we have done or the methodologies that we have used. Now, to start off with, before that, I usually try to do is ask some questions and try to understand or gauge the emotion of the room. So please help me around with that. There is no correct or uh, incorrect answer in this case. Just by a quick show of hand, if I use the term digital technology, how many of you feel negative about digital technology? Wow. Okay. At least there are some people. Good. Uh, without going into the definitions of what digital technology might mean or nuances of that, how many of you feel positive about digital technology? Oh, I think I have. Thank you for coming to my tech talk. I should be leaving now. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I think it, it's, it's very important to have both sides and I think it's very good that we have both sides even if there are people who are skeptical a little bit about the negative effects of the technology. But still, uh, one more thing is something that I would like to ask you now, if someone could volunteer and tell me about, what is the first memory that you get when I mention the term digital technology? Can anyone tell me? You don't need to have a mic as well, just tell me. Yeah. Sorry? Calculator. calculator, okay. Which one, the Casio one or the scientific calculator? The Casio one. The Casio one, okay. Anyone else? The classic snake game. Classic snake game. Oh, you mean the brick game? Oh, okay. Okay. That's good. Anyone else? Pager. Okay. That's good. The game box, right? The brick game that we used to play when we were kids. Okay. That's good. Anyone else? Yeah. MS Paint. Okay. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. So I'll take you through what term comes in when I think about this term, digital technology. And this is more about these things. My first memory of a digital technology comes from 1993 when I first used a computer in my life. And that computer was a computer that used to run Windows NT 3.1. I'm not sure if anyone of you has ever used it. Oh, OK. There are a few people, so I don't feel that old. OK. Uh, I can still count the seconds, by the way, on this screen. I'm not sure how many of you remember when, at that time, when we used to turn off the computer, it was not like you just leave and go. It was you have to actually wait before the computer was ready to be shut down, and this was that dreadful screen, right? So I actually remember all these kind of things. Now, this is also the place where uh, gigabytes or these kind of terms were also as unheard as a smartphone was. This was something like 1993, even Justin Bieber wasn't born then. Uh, so in this case, this is something to the left. How many of you can relate to this, by the way? How many of you have seen this part? OK. Can anyone tell me what this is? And people who have seen this screen should not answer. <laughs> yeah. Can someone tell me who has uh, not seen this screen, but still can tell me what that one is? Yeah, dial-up connection, like 56 kbps modems that first started off, and that was the first breakthrough in the internet. How, uh, what is the oldest memory of yours in terms of using the internet? Internet, first time, first time coming online for the... 1993, that was pretty early, like even... Okay. Sorry? Mosaic, okay, you use that? All right. The, the, the oldest that I could go, sorry, what? Okay, the, the, the earliest memory that I have is to use Netscape Navigator, even before Internet Explorer. So yeah, this was a time where I actually, uh, actually introduced myself to the realms of technology. I started using the computer for the first time in my school lab. I used to do the basic programming in BASIC itself. There was a programming language called BASIC if you, if for people who are too young. Or, uh, okay. Okay, so we, we used to draw some graphics over there. We used to write some programs over there. We used to work on MS-DOS and all. So this was my first foray into technology, and that was something that uh, I never looked back after that. So this is the place where my emotions usually come from, that 
where the feeling of empowerment comes in, where the feeling of actually being uh, comfortable with technology comes in, is coming from that era when the PCs were actually coming in and the internet was a new thing. So, uh, looking back at my journey, I actually consider myself as a fortunate person who was able to grow with the internet. Internet for me was like something like my exceptionally bright elder sister who was someone to mimic or follow the footsteps of and I had to just rush and catch up with her because that's how the technology was growing in the 90s as well and after 2000 it was like exponential. So that is how my connection with technology has been and uh, I used to spend all my extra time in my computer labs in my school and tweaking stuff and writing some programs or trying to write some programs at least most of them with edits but that is how it was for me. Uh, then, I would also mention about this thing, and this is a very personal thing. After, apart from my parents and teachers, I would also say that the technology is also something that has enabled me to actually make my career, to actually guide my education, and to actually be able to stand here and tell the story. This whole thing is enabled by my interest and my exposure to technology. And back in 2005, when I actually moved from Bhopal to Kanpur to enter IIT at that time, most of uh, the computing was pretty new. Most of the computing technology was also available inside the campus itself. I was pretty ecstatic about the amazing computers that we used to find in the computer center in, the, uh, in Kanpur. Um, and uh, we had, I think at that time, we used to claim we had the fastest internet in the country, not inside any other IITs, but even our IIT had the best internet in the connection. And so all these exposures actually built up my whole experience. And I still remember there were so many of my friends who got into computer science engineering and they saw the computers for the first time in their lives. And they were literally typing on the computers like this like a typewriter's primitive uh, version. So all those people, just because they were so privileged after entering into this kind of an ecosystem where they were able to get their exposure into technology, they were able to grow themselves and they were empowered in a different manner. But there was also another world which was outside. And at that time as well in 2005, there were people who were using the internet or their foray into internet was only through internet cafes, cyber cafes, and I'm, not sh I'm sure that most of you might have gone through cyber cafes at some point or the other in India and how crammed they are and how terribly painful they are. And this was the only exposure that they had at that time. So this was a world that was not as privileged as we had. And that's also what one of the painful experiences that made people come onto online experiences using computers. But, Today, if you look at that, I'm just trying to read some of the numbers because I don't have them at the top of my head. Uh, right now, if we go by the numbers that have been shared by the UNESCO and other, about 3 billion people, and more than half of them are in Asia, are online today. And these people are online via smartphones. So we have a different background of coming online. We grew up with the technology, we grew up with how computers advanced, how the CRT monitors gave way to LED monitors and other things. But these people are coming online for the first time in their lives and the first thing that they see is smartphone. For them, if you ask them internet, if you ask them the definition of what the internet is, they would say WhatsApp. If you ask them the definition of internet, they would say it's Facebook. They don't know what exactly the term internet means, they don't know what Google is, they don't know what search is, but for them, they are connected online because they have a data plan on their phone and they are connected on Facebook with their friends, they are connected on WhatsApp with their friends. So this is their definition of uh, being connected. Now, uh, I would like to also ask one more question that how many of you can relate to this difference in the privileges? Like all of you are students in IIT and all of you have families outside IIT. Do you also feel the difference between the privileges that you get inside because of the exposure that you get to technology here versus your family members or friends outside? How many of you can relate to this difference? Okay, okay, that's good. So um, this is something that I usually try to do as an empathy exercise to understand what kind of audience am I talking to. Now in this case, you made this thing very easy for me because most of you can relate to how these kind of differences might be when you talk to probably your family members, your grandparents, your maids in the house, your uh, maybe mothers in most of the cases, maybe aunts or something like that. 
there is a huge difference between what your exposure levels in technology are and what their exposure levels in technology are. And this is where we try to look for which kind of person are we trying to solve for. And this is, when I say we, it is more like not Google, but just any tech industry product. If you talk about Facebook, if you talk about WhatsApp, if you talk about Google or anyone else, they all try to look for which is the exact person that I'm solving this for. So, This brings me that uh, we have a term in technical industry that whatever new technology comes, it usually starts from the privileged few at the top, maybe in the Silicon Valley, maybe in the big cities of India. All the new things would start from the people who can afford these things, who have nicer smartphones, who have other privileges. And then it will slowly trickle down into the lower strata of the society, which are not as affluent as privileged and so on. But this is something that has been totally proven wrong in the last few years. And this is something that we have been seeing, and this is where the term comes in, is the next billion users. We all have, across the globe, about first billion users who have grown up with technology. People like you and me who have learned internet, who have learned computers when they were computers, like personal computers, now it's totally laptops. So those were the first billion users, and now it's a surge of next billion users who are coming online for the first time, who are interfacing with technology for the first time. So now it's become more and more important for us to start thinking about how these people are similar and different than us. They are similar in most of the things, like they have similar aspirations like us. We all wanted to learn some new languages. We all wanted to post something on our social media. We all wanted to learn something on Wikipedia, for example. And they also have the same kind of skin uh, aspirations in their lives. But there are differences between them and us. The differences being in terms of the resources, in terms of the exposure, in terms of the modalities, like we used to learn things from computer. We used to interact with computers with a mouse and a keyboard. The only thing that they know is there is a tablet, there is a glass looking screen, and I have to do everything on that. That is the computer for them, that is the technology for them. So this is a very big difference between the people that are coming online for us. But even in this case, even if I call it, these are the next billion users, can anyone would be able to stand up and tell that this is exactly the qualities of this uh, next billion user? It would be very hard to pinpoint that. So that brings us to the question, and this is where we define personas, is who are the next billion users? How do we define them? How can we say that you and I, do we, do we belong to the next billion users? or people who are actually helping us, the staff, the drivers, the auto rickshaw uh, people, or the hawkers, are they the new next billion users? So, the next billion users in that case is, it can be across any different age. Right now, it could be a child, it could be an adult, it could be an old person who is like 60 plus. They could be coming from stunningly different background than us. They would be coming from having very painfully different experiences than us. They would be coming from totally different socioeconomic class, maybe geographies from us. And they would be totally different in terms of how their approach towards the internet or the technology is. So we have to always remember whenever we try to talk about empowerment, we have to be very specific about who are we trying to empower and why, and how are we trying to empower them. We can empower a person with a disability by giving them a wheelchair. We can empower a person with a disability by other means as well. But what exactly is that person looking for in terms of empowerment is always coming back from the aspirations. And all these people who are talking, we are talking about as next billion users are coming from exactly the same uh, aspirations of socioeconomic development, growth in terms of education, uh, improving their livelihoods, getting connected in this disconnected world with their families, containing their cultural values, like some of the things that we have heard is, oh no, smartphones are bad, because why? They disintegrate the Indian culture. Uh, they empower women to actually start sharing, whereas the smartphones are something that should only be with men. So these kind of things are also, that have been shared, or they have been responded by people when we try to talk to them. Uh, the more we research these populations, the more we try to find out that there are so unique and different problems that what we have or what we have seen. And these are the kind of things that you can see. Uh, at least when I was a kid, I was not able to ever imagine that my parents would be giving me such kind of precious device in my hand. Like these kind of devices are very particularly precious because uh, people who are living on daily wage, they still have these kind of devices. And still, if they are able to share that with, with their children, there are some reasons behind that. So we'll come over to this, but this is just building up that who are we trying to empower and who are we trying to solve for. The way we can approach this is by going very specific 
And for this, I would like to take everyone through the story of a common family in India. And these are some of the stories that are not very specific to India. These are some of the stories that we have seen in Nigeria, Mexico, uh, Indonesia, in South America, in Brazil, in, uh, in uh, Chile, and all the other places. So these are just metaphors or the kind of problems that we are seeing. But they, the kind of aspiration, the kind of in, uh, like problems are very similar and very common. So we will try to go by the story of just one single family and see what kind of problems do they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so let's start with the story of a girl. She's a 12-year-old child, and she goes to a government school. Now, how many of you have been to government schools? That's good. Now, you know how pathetic the teachers there are. Usually, they are pathetic as well as apathetic in terms of they usually are more interested in terms of the logistics. Right now, if you go and ask anyone in the terms of teachers, they usually do not have the qualifications to be a teacher. They do not have the quality, uh, qualifications as well as time to actually manage students. Even if they are interested in teaching, they are assigned students about 300 or 400 or 500. At that time, I'm not sure how someone is able to teach students with that number. If they do not have that kind of interest, they are busy with the logistic midday meal schemes, all the other kind of stuff. So in this case, a very general scenario that we might have as Indian students very well seen this, that our teacher asks us to stand up. So the teacher, in this case, Sujata's teacher, asks her to stand up between the class and start reading a paragraph for the class. Now, <clears throat> Sujata picks up the storybook. She is more like in a fifth standard, but the text that she's trying to read is more like a second standard text. She starts, like, she starts getting cool feet because she's not able to blend and mix the word and start reading simple, simple sentences like ye mira ghar hai because it becomes very hard for her to combine different letters and make them into words. And when she starts doing this, when she starts struggling, all her classmates actually turn to her. How many of you have been in that situation where you have been standing in the middle of the class and some of your people or friends have been snickering at you, smirking at you, or staring at you? What exactly is wrong with you? I have been there. I have always been like, like when my teacher asked me to do something, at times I could get the cool feet like this. So Sujata usually gets cool feet like this because she is a struggling reader in this case. Now, she struggles for some time, and the teacher is not helpful in this case, which most of the government school teachers are like that. And they start scolding the uh, child that you are a bad student, you always try to chit-chat, you never pay attention in the class, you, you are just uh, not, not uh, what, what do we call, uh, no good student in the class. And this actually lowers the confidence of Sujata, and she actually sits down and she just sulks in her seat. This is what something that we all must have gone through in one of the times that we were in school in India. Now, coming back, once she, once she goes back to her house, she talks to her mother. Lakshmi is a 30-year-old housewife. She's only studied till grade two in India. She can only barely read Hindi words. She's not at all literate in English. Now, what happens is when her children, both her children, like Lakshmi and her younger brother, come, after lunch, they try to sit with the mother to help, get help in homework. But since the mother is struggling in terms of her literacy as well, she's not able to do that. And that also nudges the mother to an embarrassing kind of situation where she's not able to help her own children in their basic studies. And this is just a study in fifth standard or second standard or third standard. What she does is she actually tries to make an alibi or an excuse that I have to make dinner, so let me go back to the kitchen. You continue to do this. My, maybe your father will come and help you later on. And in this case, what happens is she drops some of the stuff and she breaks it and she breaks her rolling pin as well. So she asks her daughter to pick up her feature phone and call her father. And what happens is when the daughter replies, I have told you so many times how to use the phone, but you don't get it. This is the kind of conversation that is very common in the society is that children are the ones who usually know more in terms of technology than the parents and the parents usually take the help of the children. So the children actually rebuke in some of those senses that you do not, if, even if I have been teaching you for so long, you do not know how to use a smartphone. You just press number two, you just press the green button and that's how you place a call. But still it is very intimidating for the mother to actually place the call and she just goes back to the kitchen embarrassed not to get into this judgmental kind of discussion. Let's come to the father who's outside in the market. He has gone to take out some money and this person it's a very common thing, even before demonetization, to, for people not to have had ATM cards. People used to go to the banks, people used to go and withdraw money by filling in the forms and details and standing in lines and all kinds of things. So this father is actually facing the same thing. This father is reasonably literate in Hindi, but uh, struggling to read in, in English. This father also took inspiration from his brother-in-law brother -in to get a smartphone. So he saved for about six, seven months and got about a 5,000 rupee uh, cheap smartphone for himself. 
Now he's totally fond of WhatsApp and chatting with his friends and getting all the forwards of good morning, good evening, good night kind of thing and watching videos on YouTube. So this person is actually the most advanced in terms of technology in the family. But this person also struggles in a different way. The person goes into uh, the bank. The person tries to take out the money from the bank and then comes to know that there are government schemes to help this person save some money. But how do we get the government schemes? For that, you have to go to a website and the website is in English. So he is not able to go through and consume the website and get the benefits for his family. So all these kind of things are pretty common. These, these might seem very extreme, but these are pretty common across different geographies, across different demographics. All these are deeper issues. They are not issues with technology. They are not issues with exposure to technology or awareness about these things. They are deeper issues which stem for things like literacy, uh, self-confidence, self-esteem, and all these kind of things. And this is where the technology actually comes in play. And this is what we have seen, that if a person who is using a smartphone has a sudden jump in terms of the confidence that I have been using a smartphone and my family, no one else was the first person to actually use a smartphone. So all these are deeper issues which actually uh, take us to find out some unique challenges that are there. So some of the unique challenges that we can see in the behaviors happening is that there are different income levels in the society or there are different literacy rates in the society. So in that case, what happens is income levels do not uh, define if a person would buy an iPhone versus a Samsung J7, for example, or a feature phone, income levels define who will be in the family that would use a smartphone. If there is a woman in the family and she is not earning, she would be the last person in the family to actually own a smartphone or to actually learn the smartphone. If there is a woman in the family who's earning more than the male, then she would be the person who would be having the smartphone rather than the male one. So income in that way defines the hierarchy of smartphone exposure in this family. The literacy rates is something that is a personal favorite of mine just because I'm working on this as well. Is literacy is something that is not just related to people reading stuff on the screen. It is also about understanding the abstract concept. How many of you can use Google Maps? I assume all of you can use Google Maps at least, right? Sorry, what? You can. can, okay. So Google Maps is an abstract representation of maps where you are looking at a top-down view, you are looking at different colors, you are not associating them with a road. Whereas people who are not literate actually consume these kind of things in a totally different way. If I have to tell a person who's not literate to actually view the road on the mobile phone, they would be absolutely confused by the way Google Map representation is. Google Map representation is there is a blue line, you have to follow that blue line, you have to take the left turn or right turn, all those kind of things. These people do not understand this. The thing that they understand is I can see a physical representation or a photo of a road and I can see a building over there and this is how I can remember. I can see this in the phone, I can see in the real life and that's how I can map and I can actually navigate myself. So the literacy is something that is also a big hampering in terms of exposure to technology. This actually led us to ask two questions. Why is literacy important? And this is totally a technology discussion, but you might say, why is literacy coming in in this picture? Because literacy is one of the foundational elements that will enable technology. So we asked two questions, why is literacy important and how we as product makers should focus and enable people with low literacy skills or no literacy skills as well to use the technology in the same or similar way, if not the same way, to improve their lives. So I'll take you through some basic definition. Let me attempt to do that. How do we define literacy? Literacy is just uh, uh, defined as, if you go by the dic dictionary definition, as ability to read and write. But literacy is not exactly or just limited to reading squiggles on a page or a screen. Literacy is much more than that. Literacy is also about self-confidence. It's about uh, self-esteem. It's about being independent. It's about being able to do their day-to-day -day work without depending on anyone else. Now this is exactly a quote from a person who just goes from home to work, from work to home, because they are not able to read. And these are like very low literate workers who are usually doing day-to-day -day chores or daily wage stuff. So they are trying to mix in the whole society, but they are isolated because they are not having these foundational skills that we all take for granted. We all take literacy for granted. If I ask you, anyone to read what exactly is written, you would be able to naturally read this. But if I ask some other person, if I, for example, change this text to maybe Chinese or maybe some other script, 
it would be exactly the same emotion that that person will go through, that I am only seeing squiggles on the screen. I'm not able to see or relate to any of these things. So in today's world, we, and this is a big claim again uh, that I'm making is, literacy or not being literate can be very similar to having a disability. Because in disability, and this is with no offense to anyone with a disability, in disability, you might have to depend a lot more on other people to help you do some very, very regular stuff, like even getting up from the bed or even going out to the market or buying something. Not being literate can also feel exactly like that. Literacy in daily lives, like these are the routine things that we take for granted. If we have to go to the shop and just compare prices of different items, I need to have Lay's, I need to have Uncle Chips, or I need to have something else, I need to have a biscuit. I need to compare good day is better or I need to compare Monaco is better or something like that. Just because I'm literate, I'm able to do these things very naturally and fluently. Even if I have to cross the road, I can see that this is a road sign that says that I have to go and take a diversion. But all the people who are illiterate or who are struggling with literacy are not able to do these kind of things because this is such a foundational thing in their lives that is missing. By the way, all these things seem very extreme again because the place that we are standing from, it might be very distant, but do you exactly have an idea or even just have a guess how much of the population around the world is actually influenced by this or how much is impacted by this? It's this much. This is, according to UNESCO, this is the number of total adult illiterates. This is only the adult illiterates, not the total children who are illiterates or who are this. And this is about 15% of global population. And this is also something that they have actually measured, something that they were able to measure. There were so many people that they were not able to measure, so the numbers could be even higher. So in this case, it becomes more and more natural to focus more on the literacy as a foundational element. Now, before we even go into the details of the foundational elements, and right now I'm even just uh, setting up the whole problem. We first talked about the users or who are the people. Now we are talking about defining what kind of problems do they face and what kind of problems can we as people uh, who take these for granted can oversee. There are two types of literacy as well in terms of uh, uh, definitions. One is the literacy of the language. When we read something, when we can read English, uh, English Hindi or any other language. And then there is a tech literacy where I'm able to understand what does cancel mean. I'm able to understand what does save mean in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, technology. I'm able to understand what does files mean in terms of technology. So these kind of tech literacy and language literacy are totally different and they all have their different problem. People might be literate. My parents are literate, but they still struggle to understand what does cancel mean? What does file mean or save as mean or something else like these kind of terms? So we always have to be cognizant about what kind of problem are we trying to solve and become as narrow as possible in terms of understanding where the problem is coming from. But this also brings us to why well, have been like we can easily make apps for or products for the developed world and continue making money. Why should we care about solving these kind of things? Why should we care about even talking about literacy or such a difficult thing uh, or empowering the population like this? The reason is, if you can see in this image itself, this is a beggar who's sitting beside a road. And this person, he might not be having a home, he might not be having much of his belongings, but he does have a phone. He does have a smartphone. Smartphones in the society or across the world are aspirational. They are considered status symbols. They are considered a sign of respect that this person now knows how to use a smartphone. So this person is actually a higher level in the society. So these are some of the reasons that people are clinging or moving, gravitating towards more and more <coughs> smartphones. Now, when they come across smartphones, they actually struggle to use these things. So in that case, it becomes an onus on us to actually define how do people who are having these kind of problems with literacy or uh, uh, you can say income levels, they continue using smartphones as easily as they could. So this is where the suggestions or the principles start. And this is uh, what we have found in our researches as well, that the next billion users actually look for these kind of things. They have changed the internet or technology in these three ways. They are approaching the technology in a mobile only fashion. They are not, they might not be able to ever use mobile, uh, sorry, computers or laptops. They would always be consuming stuff on the mobile phones. So everything that we might have to think from is from the mobile perspective. How can we enable things that are mobile friendly? Because mobile is something that is accessible or available to most of the people in the society, but the laptops and the computers might not be. The second stuff that we see is ubiquitous computing. Uh, what does it mean is, 
we have grown up with uh, certain understanding of technology. We understand that there is a keyboard where we type, there is a mouse that is a pointing device on a GUI or a uh, digital user interface. Uh, but these people do not have that. The only pointing device they have is the finger. And the only way they interact is by tapping on the screen or a glass device, that's it. So this is something that they are habitually with, that everyone, I do not have to uh, type a search query like what is the weather, sorry, weather Ahmedabad today. I would rather ask that should I carry my umbrella today in Ahmedabad or not? Because that is a more natural and a more human way uh, to approach this or this question. The last one is local languages. And I'm not sure how many of you struggled with, but is anyone interested in local languages apart from English? Like in terms of uh, reading online stuff in Hindi or Gujarati or some other language? How many of you are interested in that? How many of you actually struggle in trying to find out stuff in your local languages? It's a big problem. The typing is difficult. Uh, there are fewer web pages or much fewer web pages compared to English. The whole web is based on English. And this is where people uh, like who are from the academic community are coming in. This is where the digital humanities come in where the old, uh, you can say manuscripts or old books are being converted to online or digital versions. So this is where the repository of local language stuff is actually increasing. So these are some of the three things that have actually evolved into principles. Uh, so the first principle again is mobile only. People try to use mobile phones as an interface. They would never go and go online or understand how does a keyboard work. They would, even the typing on a keyboard, even English keyboard is very hard for them. So what they do is they usually try to talk to the uh, app. I'm not sure how many of you have used Google Assistant or voice typing somewhere. How many of you have tried that? How many of you have failed to do a correct query by uh, talking to your mobile phone? Like you wanted to search for something and it totally searched for something else. I'll tell you one of the most crazy incidences in one of my research. One person was actually searching for Canada field songs. You understand what that term means? Canada field songs means romantic or emotional songs in Canada. So he was trying to call and talk loudly to the phone, show me Canada field songs. And the search query was coming out as Canada field songs. Right? And this resulted in nothing in terms of search queries. So these kind of frustrating experiences are very common and we have to actually build more on top of these kind of things. The last one is the local languages and it's a big thing. I try to search for something and every result that I get is in English. I try to, for example, look for a bhajan or an arti uh, or something like that in Hindi and the only thing that I can get is totally in English and I don't understand English. So whatever I can get, I usually try to make do with that. And that's why you might see there are so many abrupt and random good morning messages, which might totally be double meaning or something like that. And still our parents or family members keep sending us and spamming us with those because that's how the internet works. You search for good morning and they have good morning to your girlfriend and they have good morning to your boyfriend or something like that. And this is your parents or your family members or elders actually sending in family WhatsApp groups and everyone is saying very, very good. Very so these kind of things are very common just because we have not been able to serve these people better. So uh, this is usually where uh, solving for the needs come in, that we understand that these are the problems. We understand that these are the needs of the people. But how do we actually, we can build or we can build interfaces which are image heavy and not text heavy and still uh, make it usable for people who are not literate but ultimately would it empower them to a bit. But the idea to empower them is coming from this code. This is a very cheesy code. I'm not sure who this person was who said this, but yeah. It says that the first part is more about giving the person actually what the person needs. I'm asking for a fish, I'm hungry, you give it to me. Versus you are making me capable of going and finding my own food. Or you are actually filling in my aspiration of not being hungry ever. So this is where the whole uh, philosophy comes in is uh, we have to look at the user problems in the context of what they are looking for. When we talk to people that what do you want exactly, some people say that I cannot understand English. I cannot, uh, I want to read English. That is a very immediate ask. This is the same thing that you do on Google search. You go, I want to look and I want to find out what exactly it does or where exactly is IIT uh, Gandhinagar, for example, what exactly is the address. So those kind of things are a different set of problem. And for that, we had one prop, 
product that is called Google Lens. So this is exactly for people who come across different languages that they're not able to read. For example, in this case, this is a parking sign that is in English and people are not able to read English. What they do is they just take a photo and that contextually converts that text into Hindi or any other language that they can use. You can use it if you have Google Lens right now in your phone, if you have Google Now app, or if you have a Google Go, you can actually use this and test it out on different languages. So it converts it like this. So this is how the translate is happening, and I'm, I'm sorry that uh, GIF is playing so slow in this. But bear with me, yeah, please. So this is how it renders. How many of you actually saw this before? This room. So this is where we approach to solve the problem immediately. You want to convert this text from English to Hindi? Good, you do it like this. But how do we enable them to actually be able to read or learn to read is where we come with Bolo. This is the app that I am working on as a design and research lead and this is where we are trying to help children learn to read in their native language as well as English. Because English in India, or at least the developing markets, is very, very aspirational. If you know English, even if you are able to speak English in a very bad way or a broken way, like if you are speaking something like, I couldn't do it, you still are considered much higher in terms of status level versus people who are totally illiterate in English. So in this case, this is how uh, the interface looks like, or this is how the app works, where the child actually reads uh, the stories and it gets feedback. Because this comes back to, if you remember, how did all of us start learning to read? It was either a parent, it was either an older sibling, it was someone else in the family who actually sat with us and started helping us learn to read, maybe with the letters, maybe with the words, maybe with the stories. So that is the way where we are doing this. And if you see in this case, there is this character which we have morphed into that this is Dia, this is the reading buddy which helps you learn to read. Now can you see that there is an exaggerated pose and she is doing something like this. This means that the mic is listening. We all know the mic feedback, when you press mic, the mic starts pulsating on Google or Siri or somewhere else. But those kind of feedbacks are again abstract concepts for them because they are totally illiterate users. So this is the challenge, is how do you make an app to help people learn to read who cannot read? And this is the kind of solutions that we actually look for. We actually look for real life solutions. If we have to say that the mic is muted, that the app would not be able to listen, then she puts her fingers in her ears as well so that she's not able to listen. Now, when the mic is not listening, when you're not reading, she sits like this. But when she is listening, she is actually doing this exaggerated pose because all these kind of things are more relatable to children or people who are not able to read or understand. This brings me to more like the conclusion of this that we have always, uh, as humans, used technology to improve our lives, be it the time of just coming out with a wheel, be coming out with a fire, or anything like that. That kind of technology has always been there. And it usually, uh, we associate technology with the fancy stuff like SpaceX or uh, self-driving cars or solar panels or something like this. But technology is usually much more deep-rooted into your language, like roti kapla or makan are all some things that built up from technology. So this is where we have to aspire for empowerment that yes, people need uh, exposure to technology, but for what? for their aspirational motives, for their empowerment that they are looking for. I want to improve my salary, that's why I'm looking. There, there are instances of people using Google to, uh, who were hawkers on the, on the railway stations and they use Google to actually listen to lessons on YouTube. And then they appeared for civil services examination in Kerala and they got into a, a government position. So these kind of society uh, examples are all prevalent. But these are the things that we have to be very focused and we have to actually work hard to look for and find out. We can easily make a search engine again. We can easily make something that is usable, that is easy to use or convenient. But that actually empowers people and just develops the core problem and solves it. It's a very hard thing. And that needs a lot more stuff from people in academic community. Because for example, I can give you a personal example in terms of Bolo. Literacy has different levels. And we don't know, we are not pedagogy experts. Pedagogy experts are people like you who are in the academia, who understand, who study literacy, who study how people read, who study what kind of uh, methods should we need to use to help children learn to read, maybe phonics, maybe not phonics or something like that. So this is where the collaboration has to come in from your side as well, where uh, these are the researches or these are the methodologies that we have found in terms of helping people go from one socioeconomic level to other or move from one literacy level to other. And these are some of the things that people like us can use and actually improve onto how people are using these things. 
Now, one of the ideas or one of the questions that I keep hearing is, we all do these kind of researches, but why do we need to do it at mass scale? The thing is, in terms of consumer products is the only way you can actually have an impact at large scale. I have enough number of research papers or enough publications which are very small or which have been, like one of the things that were, Mr. Dr. Raj was also telling me about was, in terms of his math skills, uh, like he was making an app or an iPad to help children learn math. But this was, again, an academic project, and it was, first of all, done by undergrads. So, yeah, sure, it would never get completed, definitely. So these kind of things are uh, things that we expect from the academia uh, to help us and make the impact a large-scale impact as well. Uh, the last thing that I would say is the more we make the playing ground equal for people, the easier it would be, us, it would be for us to empower the people and bring them at the same, le same level. People would be empowered by not making the, just the technology accessible or by making things usable. They would be empowered if the technology actually serves their aspirations. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for not sleeping through this whole thing. <laughs>